Great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. And uh, my name is Rafael Sadi, Diversity Council Chair for ARP Louisiana. Before we start today's cooking show, I would like to take a few moments to tell you something about AARP. In Louisiana, we proudly serve more than 43,000 members with offices located in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and volunteer teams and chapters throughout the state. Presently, our offices are closed due to pandemic, but we're working together to bring events and activities to you such as this one. Today we recognize National Hispanic Heritage Month to celebrate the acknowledge the histories, accomplishments, cultures, and contributions of Latino Americans whose ancestors came from Mexico, the Caribbean, Central and South America, and Spain. This observation started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Johnson and was expanded by President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover a full 30-day period starting on September 15th and ending on October 15th. In addition to reflecting this unique act, uh, Hispanic history and culture, this is also a great time to celebrate through food. Hispanic food is delicious and there is more than one way to create a Hispanic dish. Every Latin American country has its own style of food which makes it more amazing. Today, you will be introduced to those international recipes without needing a passport, luggage, or hotel, all you need is a kitchen. Joining us from ARP Louisiana is Linera McIver, Director of Multicultural Outreach and Engagement, who will be joining the chefs from Tulane University, Gold Ring Center for Culinary Medicine. Welcome everyone. And now here is Heather to explain a few technical tips. Hello, Heather. Take it away. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Again, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rafael. And it's so nice to hear a little bit about the background of uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month, the reason that we are here today on this class. Um, I, just to go over a couple of things with everybody, if you are not a Zoom wizard, if you are uh, a little less familiar with the Zoom platform, I just want to mention a few things before we get started and have Amber um, leading this wonderful cooking class today. We do have everybody muted just to keep things quiet, um, but we would love to hear if anybody is cooking along with us this morning, and if so, you can certainly feel free to unmute yourself um, at any point to chime in, ask a question, Tell us how you're doing. The mute button, if you're on a computer, should be on your lower left-hand side of the screen. You'll see a little microphone. You can click that off and on to mute and unmute yourself. Right next to that button, you will have the option to either share or stop your video. Um, so if anybody wants to show us your video during the class, we always love to see your faces, um, as well as if you are cooking along, we love if you show us your food at the end of class, of course, that's always a fun, fun thing. Um, if you are on an iPad, I will just mention that your, uh, your viewing will be a little different. And usually you have to do some swiping back and forth on your screen to get to the right type of view. So during today's class, I'm gonna have Amber's camera spotlighted so that you can be seeing her face front and center and seeing her pan front and center and her cutting board so that you can really see the action that's happening. And I do my best to you know, go back and forth through those various views for you. Um, but in order to see that view correctly, you wanna set your view to the speaker view, which means that it's highlighting the speaker at that moment. Right now, I have my view set to gallery, which means I see all the little boxes with everybody's pictures there or their names, um, which is fine. You can do that if you choose. But 
in order to see the best view, you'd want to set to speaker. On an iPad, that is done through swiping left and right. On a computer, you're going to do it in the upper right-hand corner of your screen where it says view. I'm actually going to turn it over now to Miss Lynetta, who I think has a few more announcements for us, excuse me, before we get cooking in the kitchen. Thank you so much, Heather. And as you mentioned earlier, it's a pleasure to join you all um, during the month of September. Um, she mentioned earlier, we were scheduled for the 15th of the month, but because of the storm, we know many were having challenges with internet and electricity. I did want to remind you though, as you saw on the registration page, for those who are cooking um, either one of the dishes, all of the dishes, please share your camera today because I will need to get your address so um, I can send you the AARP apron um, that Amber is wearing. Amber, show your apron. So who's joining us today and who's cooking with us today will receive um, an apron. And that was just a, a brief reminder. Also next month, um, our next month's cooking show, October 20th, we will um, offer the same giveaway for those who are joining us. But in addition to the apron, we will also offer the cooking spoons. So we're trying to get everyone who is cooking or who would like to join us to become more involved and more engaged. Um, we appreciate you joining today. Thank you very much and take it away. Heather, Amber, the show is yours. I'm about to start cooking. Awesome, thanks Lynetta. Um, yeah, and just so for those of you who might be new to joining us on this class, um, we are from the Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine. My name is uh, Heather. I am the Director of Operations here. I'm a chef dietitian. And then um, our chef of the day today is going to be Chef Amber, which let me go ahead and spotlight her video. So Chef Amber is cooking from, I'm at the office today, but Chef Amber is cooking from her home kitchen. And um, she is a chef with a degree in culinary nutrition. So she knows all about how to make food taste good, but also make sure that we're keeping nutrition and health in mind. So we are going to be doing that today while we celebrate these dishes um, that have a little bit of Hispanic flavor and ingredients incorporated. Amber, I'm going to turn it over to you to get started for us today. Perfect. Okay, so today we're going to be making um, some, uh, actually a handful of dishes. We've got five different um, recipes that we're working with. As a reminder, all the recipes and resources are all located um, on one page on the Gold Ring Center, including your link on how you can sign up for the, these classes. Um, so I'll be starting with our salt-free taco seasoning, then we'll go through and make our cabbage slaw. Um, we're making a sweet and spicy apple, apple cabbage slaw, as well as some chicken fajita bowls. And then we'll be moving into a frozen margarita mocktail. Um, for the prep, um, you always hear me say that we should mise out everything that we're going to be making. So I have a little containers of all the supplies that I'm going to need. Um, so you want to work on pulling those for the recipes you'll be making. Additionally, we should get our rice water going. We're going to be doing a pasta method on our rice today, which just means that how we treat pasta. We'll bring the water to a boil, add the rice in, and then just let it cook until we're ready and then we'll strain it. So you're going to get your water boiling. Whenever it's boiling, add your rice. Feel free. Don't wait for me. And then we are going to just make sure you have your chicken is thawed. Um, you gotta have it nice and ready to cook up soon. Okay, so a couple things that we're gonna be doing in this first portion, we're gonna be talking about some spice blends. Um, Heather let me know that it's pretty across the board as far as how spicy that y'all like your spice blends. Um, but in general, for the one that we're making today, we're making a salt-free taco seasoning. Um, you can choose how spicy you wanna make it. I really love spice blends because then we're able to have a nice little container. I have a bunch along my back wall where I have all these containers of pre-made blends and I can just add a little bit onto my dishes to make them super flavorful and very easy to make, especially during the week. So for this taco seasoning, I'm gonna pull down so you can see, I already scooped out my spices. Hopefully I can turn this without mixing it. So for this, we have, our chili powder, um, it's predominantly chili powder and onion powder. It's three tablespoons each. 
And then I have one tablespoon each of cumin, coriander, garlic powder, um, and paprika. I went with a smoked paprika. I really love smoked paprika as a whole because it adds a really nice, um, deeper, complex flavor to our dishes. And then we'll be touching more our smoked peppers later on. Um, and then it has some black pepper and our cayenne. So the cayenne's optional. You can decide how much you'd like to add. I went pretty mild with mine because I'd like to add more heat and control that for every dish. And then all we're doing once we have that is just mixing it together and trying to make sure that we have some even blending. You'll wanna store this in a cool, dry place. So I go with little glass containers. Plastic would be fine, but you just wanna make sure it's covered because it does clump, especially that onion powder. So once we have it all mixed together, then you can just choose however much you're gonna to eat today. We are gonna use a salt-free taco seasoning, this recipe for later in our fajita bowls, um, which is a little misleading because it's good for everything. I like to put this on my herbs. I mean, sorry, I like to put this on my vegetables when I'm roasting. Um, it's really great. We're doing the fajita today instead of a taco. It's also really great on tortilla chips, um, which we'll talk about later as well. So I'm gonna give that one a pause and put that on the side. Now for our taco seasoning, we're gonna, Heather's gonna pull up a little touch point of some other different ones that we have. Um, and for our taco seasoning, the reason we really wanna focus on why we're doing salt free is we wanna control that salt component in our dishes. So if you look at the sodium between, um, this is equal to teaspoons each, of our, ours has 45 milligrams sodium. That's really coming from the chili powder. Chili powder does have a decent amount of sodium in it. Um, and then versus a store-bought taco seasoning has 580 milligrams of sodium for the same, which is more than our recommendation per dish. Um, we have a threshold of trying to aim under 550 milligrams of sodium per meal um, for any recipe that we make. So Obviously, if you had this, we wouldn't be able to add the salt onto other things. And chances are you'd want to use a little bit more than two teaspoons. So we're just really being mindful and it's something we can have on hand. Um, we've done this pricing out in classes and it's very, it's um, super comparable for the store-bought version. Okay. Um, Heather, you have any other talking points on that? Um, the only thing I will say is we do, we mentioned the brand of this particular one on here. We're not trying to, uh, you know, be negative against any brand or positive against any brand. It just happens to be one that's very commonly found in the grocery store or wherever you're buying your food. Um, and it really doesn't matter what brand it is. Pretty much any store-bought taco seasoning is going to have a pretty high level of sodium. And it's just one simple way that we can really take control of the nutrition in our food by taking that extra step, pulling a couple spices out of your pantry, mixing them together in a bowl. I agree with Amber. I keep many spice blends on hand at all time so that I can have really easy ways to build flavor in a dish without a whole lot of effort in the moment. I did share in the chat box an additional handout that we have about other types of spice blend ideas that can get your you know wheels turning if you're interested in this concept. But this salt-free um, taco seasoning one is really versatile, as Amber said. Um, all right, Amber, I think... Are we moving on to our next slides? We sure are. I got to make sure I can do it on this way. Okay, so let's see. We're going to try it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I couldn't have done a better introduction on um, National Hispanic Heritage Month than Mr. Rafael. So I'm going to leave that one alone. But we do have a visual here of the countries that are represented um, in Hispanic Heritage Month. So we'll be touching upon some ingredients and some flavors that are gonna come from several different countries. Okay, so I'm really excited because I like to start with some produce that you're gonna have and it's very common in American diets as a whole. And so we're gonna be going through some produce um, that you may or may not have seen before that you um, hopefully is something a little bit familiar. So we have a better chance of trying to incorporate some of these things that you see at the store in your diet or including them in different ways. So we're going to start here with some very common American, 
average American diet ingredients. On the left, we have our coffee beans and cacao. A lot of our chocolate production happens in these countries, which is super rich and really delicious. Um, in is primarily from just hotter temp, um, hotter climates. We also have some corn and potatoes. These potatoes are gonna look a slightly different than some ones we're gonna see later. Um, and then avocados, of course. So we will be including our avocados today, but any one of these, mm, maybe not any one of them, <laughs> but potatoes and corn are really easy to incorporate this as well into this dish, which I'll talk about um, when we get further on. Um, additionally, we're, our next slide, we'll be talking about some things that are grown here in New Orleans and in Southern Louisiana because of our climate. And so we have our cilantro, which we're incorporating a lot today. We also have our fresh chili peppers. We're gonna be talking a lot about peppers as well as our hatched peppers down in the bottom. Um, we also have our tomatillos, which are up in the top corner. Those are primarily, uh, those are really great in things like a salsa verde. Um, and then in the bottom right, we have our chayote squash, AKA merlotons, right? That's what we call them locally. And so all these things are really great to be incorporating into roasted or grilled dishes. Chayote squash is similar to an apple texture. Um, it has a very mild flavor. Some say it's cucumbery. I'm not on the cucumber boat on that one, but it's definitely mild. And they're really great for things like salads and slaws. It would be so good in our slaw today as a great substitute instead of the apple. Um, from there, we can also talk about some things like apples and some common fruits. We're going to be looking at some things that are really popular in these similar climates. So we have things like our passion fruit in the top corner. Um, and then if we go towards the center, we have our mango. Next, that's our dragon fruit. Um, and the centers are plantains. And then down below on the left is guava and the right is papaya. These are all great summer fruits that are usually eaten raw. How, well, exception to the plantains, which I'll go into. Um, and they'd be all great in a slaw or salad or on, um, dishes diced up like tacos um, or in breakfast. We're always trying to encourage more fruit consumption with our Mediterranean diets. Um, and then plantains are something that we see a lot locally. Depending on the color of our plantains um, determines the ripeness, green or underripe, they're more starchy, and then they get sweeter as they get riper, just like a banana. Um, and so they're can be deep fried, shallow fried, pan cooked. Uh, at the teaching kitchen, we have some that are baked. Um, you can also find them in savory or sweet applications where they can be used as chips instead of tortilla chips, um, or they could also be stuffed um, with a bean paste, which is really um, separate different textures, right? When we can go crunchy or soft and sweet. So it's a very versatile um, produce that we can use. Talking about some more versatile things, we, on the next slide, we have some root vegetables, which I really feel are, might be the, more, the less common thing. So on the left side here, we're, we're looking at some uh, our cassava and yucca root. Um, and then on the right, these are, Peruvian potatoes. And we also have things like yams. In the bottom, we have our jicama. And then in the center, we have maca root. Jicamas it can be used similar to the way we use merloton. Um, so it has a similar texture. You can have it raw. It's also, I'm sure people have seen them as french fries or chips. Um, so they're very versatile, just like the plantain. And it has a bit of a flavor cross between like a potato and water chestnut. Um, and then for our cassava or yucca, it can be ground up and used as a flour, but it also can be used at, in any other type of root vegetable where you can turn it into a chip. You can mash it if you choose to. Um, and it cooks just like a potato. For our maca, it look, that's the thing that looks similar to a parsnip in the center. It's usually ground up and used as a powder. Um, it's considered good for your health. So a lot of people will put it into um, 
into beverages, teas. Um, here in the United States, you'll see a decent amount of those health food brands that will add it into their smoothies or their protein powders or as a supplement. Um, but traditionally would be made in a tea form. So you can see them whole, but for the most part for, assess, uh, for using it, you can find it in a powder. And then we also have our potatoes or yams that are also very common, um, which would be cooked just like our sweet potatoes and potatoes would in general. On the next slide, we're looking at a few things that I think are gonna be a little bit mixed. Uh, Epizote is our top left. It has a minty flavor. We grow this here in the garden on site at the teaching kitchen. It's really good cooked down in a tea. Um, next that we have our cinnamon and our garlic, which I'm sure everyone sees, uh, has used those in their kitchen on the regular. Um, on the bottom, we're looking at our cumin. So you can buy cumin in seed or ground. Um, I'm using ground today. And then next to that is sassafras. Sassafras is super fun because it has a cross between an anise and a lemon flavor. Um, it's usually used in sweet dishes. I'm sure that it's some, you've come along somewhere where you see the sassafras, sassafras beverages, um, which is made similar to like root beer is or in candies. Um, so it is a very sweet texture, but you can get it in leaf form locally as well. And then on our next slide, we're looking at just, I really want to focus on how a lot of the main thing about a lot of these Hispanic dishes that you'll find is there's a really great focus on fresh and flavorful dishes without an emphasis on sodium. So that can be in dried or fresh ingredients. So on the left, two left, we're looking at dried and fresh oregano. And on the right, we're looking at cilantro and in the leaf form, which we'll be using today, as well as um, coriander, which is the seed of the cilantro, uh, at the bottom of the cilantro roots. So if you'll hear a lot in different um, Hispanic dishes, they'll just have it written as um, coriander when, and they'll say fresh or dried, and that will be referring to the leaves, or, which we call cilantro, or the seeds themselves. Either way, it has a very consistent flavor, which is why it's so easy to have coriander on, on hand and on the spice rack and all of these herbs on the spice rack and then quickly be able to easily incorporate the at flavor into a dish without having to have the fresh herbs on hand. Um, and then we have a lot of great substitutions on if you're using dried versus fresh, um, it's about a fourth of a teaspoon of dried to a teaspoon of fresh. So teaspoon to a tablespoon, depending on how much you want fresh. So you really can substitute easily in most of your dishes. Um, there's a couple that maybe, if you're gonna be eating it fresh like a salad, I wouldn't. But overall, it's a really easy way to mix up the dishes. On the next slide, we're talking about peppers. And I really wanna be focusing on how great and how colorful that really the star of many dishes um, and Hispanic cuisines are gonna really have a lot of um, pepper action. And so peppers as a whole are going to be dependent on how um, each pepper is going to have a different degree of heat. It's going to have a different degree of spice. They're going to have different flavors. They're going to have different sweetness. So every pepper has to be treated differently. And we really want to be thinking about like, you can try it as you go, take a little nibble and see how you feel um, with our peppers. And they're going to come in a lot of different um preparation. So these are all fresh. On this next slide, we have a lot of different other varieties. We're talking about things like our ground, our ch chili pepper and our paprika or this brown texture in the top. Um, but then we also can do crushed red pepper, right? There's a, but there's also many other peppers that you can have crushed like this top, sorry, top left was the ground, top right is the crushed. Um, and then we can also have it in things like chilies and adobo, which is in the center which is in a paste. Adobo really refers to a spice blend. Um, and then when you buy it in a can, it's usually gonna have um, oil and vinegar in there as well. Um, you can see this a lot on recipes. Saying adobo is very similar to saying mole. It's a blanket term that can mean a lot of different things, um, depending on the person that prepped it, but it's gonna have a very forward flavor of, um, of the chili. 
and it's going to have a lot of smokiness, just like our dried peppers on the bottom. Dried peppers are usually smoked when they're dried, so they're going to have that deeper complexity of flavor like that smoked paprika I was talking about. So then we can have a lot of interesting flavor and heat. If you want to keep them dried, you can. If you want to rehydrate them, you can. Rehydrating is a really fun and impressive culinary skill skill that doesn't take much effort because all you have to do is just put them and soak them in some liquid. You can soak them in any liquid. I like to rehydrate cranberries in maybe uh, alcohol, right? You can have that absorbent. You can do the same thing if we're trying to absorb our vinegar in something like this. So that way we have a really nice flavor complexity. Um, and then that's really where you're also getting things like chipotle. Chipotle is, is a smoked pepper and it's going to have a lot of umami. Chipotle is really um, popular on many recipes and it's really just a deep smoky, um, kind of tastes a little charred um, pepper flavor. And then we also have our paste on the bottom right. And you can make paste out of rehydrated dried peppers or fresh peppers, depending on what you're starting with. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about our grains and legumes. This is my last real focal point, is a lot of these grains and legumes are gonna be things that overlap with things that you see regularly. So we are seeing a lot of pinto beans, red beans, black beans. There's also canary beans, these ones in the bottom left. They're very similar to pintos. However, they're softer and smoother um, as far as the texture. So these little smaller green beans, they're green, um, are a great substitution for dishes that call for pintos and you want a more creamy texture that will whip up. And then in the center, we're talking about our masa. Masa's on the right. It's a finer, it's a, it's a flour. It's what we're using to make tortillas. It's in tamales. This is something that's going to be a really fine powder versus next it would be our corn meal. So if we're talking about textures of, of corn, when we first grind, we'll have our grits, right? They're really rough. And then from there, we can have our corn meal, which is that more we can use to bread things. And then further than that would be our corn flour or masa. And then long grain white rices are really popular because um, they're easy to grow. But in addition to that is quinoa. Quinoa does originate um, from South America and it's You've heard me talk about it numerous times. It comes in various different colors and it has a complete, it is a complete protein, um, which most isn't very common. So we do like to talk about quinoa. It's very similar to other ancient grains like amaranth um, is also is originated from South America, but I do like to focus more so on this quinoa situation because it's so prevalent in the stores here. And then we're really just trying to see how we can incorporate these different things in. I'm making brown rice today. You could be easily be using white rice or quinoa. Same thing with our beans. I'm going to be using canned black beans, but any type of bean that you like is a great substitution. Okay, I feel good about that. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks, Amber. I really think it's nice to look at some of these ingredients um, that you know, we've probably seen them, but maybe we're not sure what the deal is on everything. Um, so that was great. What are we doing next? I think we're getting some prep on, right? Yeah, my, my rice is boiling. So I'm going to add in my, I mean, my water's boiling. So I'm going to go ahead and add in my rice um, into our, my pan. It's a cup of brown rice. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I'm really just doing a pasta method of so this pasta method that she's referring to just simply means you boil a pot of water. You don't need to measure it. And then you just add your rice in, let it boil away. And then you're going to strain the rice into a, you know, in a colander to get rid of that excess water. I like this method for people who are a little timid on the rice cooking front. I know, um, I have often struggled with cooking rice in the traditional method where you measure out your water, you bring it up to a boil, you reduce to a simmer, and you hope, you hope and pray that everything works perfectly and the rice absorbs at the right, you know, 
rate and you don't end up with rice stuck on the bottom of your pan or crunchy rice, you know, you can, it can be a little tricky to get the heat control right. So this method really is much more foolproof. Right. Um, and we have in the past sec, um, segments, which are recorded and available, we've made rice in that method that Heather's talking about. We've made a rice and quinoa blend in that same technique. So this is just a different way that we can cook grains and we can be utilizing any which form that we want. In this one, I gotta say, I thought I was a terrible chef for a very long time because I couldn't master the way of making rice. And so I've tried every other way than that traditional, uh, that way that Heather's mentioning. I'll bake it, I'll boil it, but I can't seem to figure out how to bring to a boil, reduce to a similar simmer and it works. Um, I tried Instapots, I can't get it to work. So this one works really well for me because then I'm able to get it. Um, I don't have to watch it. If I, it's coming too fast on a boil, I can reduce it down a little bit. And so hopefully, fingers crossed, this one works uh, with my back turned. Okay. Yeah, you'll get some nice fluffy rice, not all clumpy and sad. That's the goal. Okay, so we're I set, I set the heart sticker because that is the way I love to cook rice and that's the only way I'm successful cooking rice. So for everyone in the audience, um, what's your preferred method outside of a rice cooker? I know that's our go-to now. Just put it in chat if this is the preferred method for the pasta method that she talked about earlier, boiling and straining, or do you prefer the equal ratios? Put, I just wanna see in chat uh, which method you prefer for those who want to add that information. All right, in the meantime, we're gonna start up on our cabbage slaw. Now, as I mentioned, you can use any fruit for this. You can use any type of cabbage, but you can also use any type of thicker vegetable. Um, if you wanna be using jicama or chayote squash, this is a great time to, to incorporate that. Um, but for me, I'm gonna start with the cabbage. I like red cabbage because I really love colors. Um, in my dish, I teach all the kids classes and I teach them to eat the rainbow and it's because I mean it because it's so much more tasty to me visually because we're always first eating with our eyes. So we want to remove these outermost layers that are a bit um, tough. I'm just going to take those off. And so I have half a cabbage. The way we cut the cabbage is through the core, just like I'd cut an onion. So that way I have this whole core that I can keep intact as I'm going. And we're always keeping a trash container on the side so that way I don't have to worry about walking around the kitchen. I'm just gonna take these one out too, just because I'm gonna serve it raw. I don't want too tough. All right, so for cabbage, um, for the amount of cabbage I need, I only need half of this. So I'm gonna start by cutting it. And maybe I don't, but either way I wanna keep more control. And then from there, I wanna hold, I wanna think about how I want my cabbage cut. I really like to have my cabbage um, strips be small because I really am always thinking and I always get teased up um, in the kitchen because I wanna be able to fit every little bite on a fork. I want the perfect bite every time. So I like to cut my pieces a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, this is an option. Heather and I were talking about it yesterday. She doesn't do this, but what I like to do, and she'll cut it in half again and just make it safe. What I like to do is I like to cut it once, not always all the way to the core, but that way there's a cut down the center. I have two pieces, just like an onion. And then from there, I can hold my cabbage and make the finest cuts I can. So I'm cutting with my knife super close together. So I have a nice tight shred. And I can go as slow as I feel comfortable. If you're a pro, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker, that's cool. And I'm keeping in my non-dominant hand a claw so that way I don't cut my fingertips. Amber, I just wanted to make one more comment about other options you could use for this cabbage. I have definitely been known to make a slaw like this by just buying the bag of pre-shredded, you know, slaw mix or the bag of just the, you know, shredded cabbage. Or if you really like Brussels sprouts, they do sell in a lot of stores, the shredded Brussels sprouts, which could be really fun. Um, 
So I just like to mention that because there is no shame in taking shortcuts. You know, sometimes we don't have time to do this much prep work, uh, but we can still eat a healthy meal. Those pre-cut things cost a little more money usually, but, um, you know, sometimes that that's what works for you. I really like those pre-cut bags, especially if I'm only cooking for one or two people. I don't need a whole head of cabbage. I'm not going right. to eat all of that. So it's a lot easier for think if you want a quick prep, especially if they have a little bit of shredded carrot in it too, those, um, you can add a nice bit of color. So I have my purple cabbage good to go on the side. And now I can go ahead and cut up my apple. You can pick any variety. As I mentioned, I really like a lot of colors. So I'm gonna go with red apple. I'm gonna cut my red apple, just like I'm gonna cut my bell pepper, where I wanna cut one side. <clears throat> excuse me, and then see the core. And then from there, I can make sure I'm not cutting into that center. Just keep unrolling it. Then I have very little waste. And then from there, I wanna be thinking about how my apple's gonna match the rest of my cabbage. Now I'm gonna keep the skin on because the skin is going to have a lot of fiber and a lot of beautiful um, color as we move through. It also has um, a really great source of vitamin C, which a lot of people are, think that for immune function, we should be having a lot of oranges and citrus, which is true, but there's a lot of places you can get vitamin C as well. So I'm gonna cut these super fine pieces. Oh, that one's going crazy. And then when I get close to the end, you'll see I always pinch. So that way I don't cut myself. And this guy will just get again. Now, if you like this length, that's good. If you want, and after you look at it, you compare it to your cabbage. If you're like, these pieces are nice, but I want them smaller, you go ahead, just make a nice little pile and then just cut them in half. And then we have these beautiful pieces that will go alongside our cabbage. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do that with the rest of this apple. I think the apple is really nice right now because we are coming into you know the fall season. Um, it's kind of why we chose to do apple as our fruit in this slaw today. But we also have a very delicious uh, slaw recipe that we make. It's very similar to this one, but it uses diced mango which is also super delicious. I think the idea of just combining something sweet with the cabbage, which is gonna be a little bit more bitter, um, it makes a nice balanced dish. And when, you know, Amber will talk about when she does the dressing, all the other flavor elements that she's gonna add to the party. Oh, Lynetta just added some shredded carrots to hers. And she's actually also using the shredded Brussels sprouts today, Amber. Oh yeah, those are delicious. Oh my gosh, and she's gonna add some raisins. I love it. So that's what's really cool about um, you know getting more comfortable in the kitchen. You can do your own thing, right? Like you can make adjustments to recipes and feel confident. If you know that you like those flavors, go for it. Yeah, we call that using your chefiness. Once you're comfortable in the kitchen, you can start making those decisions and saying, all right, well, now I want to add a little bit of this, or I want to substitute that. Our recipes are all about trying to find a way to substitute to what you like and what you want to eat, but also what's accessible. So if you can't have, if you can't find access to something like an apple, it doesn't matter. You don't need it. You can use any type of fruit or really any type of vegetable as well to just get that texture. Yeah, I think fresh pineapple could be fun with this as well. If, you know, you're in the mood and it's in season. Um, yeah, that would be a good one. I think any of those, as I mentioned in the PowerPoint, any of those fruits, the dry, I really have a thing for dragon fruit. It's just so infrequently available, but it adds like that nice creamy, it's soft, but also crunchy, but also seedy. I don't even know what's happening in that one. It's delicious. <laughs> it has all the things. Yep. 
Um, I'm gonna use some jalapeno. For a jalapeno, you can choose how much you wanna use. So the recipe calls for a whole one, but you can also choose if you wanna include the seeds. The seeds are gonna be where the spices are in most of our peppers, as well as the pith. The white part in there is called pith. That's in, true for any pepper that we're using. So you, if you want to take that out, it'll just be less spicy. I'm cutting this just like I would cut a red bell pepper where I can make one little window to see the inside. And then I can make that window to the sky. Then I can slowly unroll it to see. So that way, hopefully, I don't have any seeds rolling around my cutting board. Boom, good to go. And from there, I can make my nice smooth strips. I really like to make jalapeno super small because I want the flavor in every bite. I don't wanna to have to have too much, too much um, heat in one bite versus the other. And anytime we're cutting, we're just, the closer we cut, the smaller the pieces are gonna be. So I'm making these super thin strips. And then I can make a, Pile. And then go with whatever is comfortable in your hand. Make all your claw. I use my thumb and my pinky to push them all together. And I'm going to go super tight. Then I'm always cutting towards my non dominant hand and moving slowly across the cutting board. I'm never feeding my fingers into the knife. That gives me a lot more control. All right. And I'm using my handy dandy bench scraper to pick everything up off the cutting board so I'm not putting a knife into my hand. All right, next we're gonna work on some cilantro and then all of our ingredients for the dressing. So. For the cilantro, I'm gonna go ahead and cut all of mine for all the dishes, because why not? And I wanna just look through and pull out any of the ones that look a little bad, because there will be some soft spots in there. So I don't wanna have all of it. And that's gonna be true of any bunch that you get. Any of our produce that we're getting, if there's a spot that's bad, that's local to the spot that it's happening. It doesn't mean you need to throw out the whole bunch or the whole pepper or whatever it may be. Just take out the pits that don't look so hot. And then, that looks good. And then I'm just gonna cut them all at the same time because I'm gonna be using it in every recipe. So if I have a bowl on hand, I can cross utilize a lot better and I don't have to keep going back to the same ingredient. All right, that technique is called picking through your greens. I know it's a super complicated name. Um, I'm just gonna run mine under the water really quick so that way I can get off any of my loose ends. Earlier, Miss Lynetta asked a question about cilantro, which I think is important to bring back up is if you should or should not use your, um, your stems. So that's a couple, that's a multifold question. I like my stems in my cilantro lime rice. Why? Well, the most cilantro, the most herb flavor of any of our fine herbs, fine herbs are the things that you can eat the stem, are going to be really potent in the stems which is why we do things like use our parsley stems for stock. So I'm gonna keep some of my stem off to the side so I can add it into my rice later, but I really wanna focus on the leaves for our salad. So what we do is we gather it all together, we roll it tight. I bend the ends in of the top so that way it's nice and held together. And then I run my knife through. When we're cutting cilantro, the small or any of our fine herbs, the closer you cut, the smaller it gets, the 
more flavor in the smaller pieces you'll get, but it will make it turn and go bad quicker. So if you're trying to cut a bunch in a prep for something, I recommend a little bit bigger pieces so it lasts longer in the fridge. But if you are going to use it all right away, like we are right now, you can go whatever size you want, whether that be nice and big or small. If you look, you can see how my cilantro is tapering from all leaf on the left to that nice stem texture on the right. And that's gonna act very similar to something like green onion type of texture in that rice. I personally have fallen victim to the cilantro taste like soap club, um, but it doesn't apply when, I'm, when I cook it. So I'll mix it into this rice and it won't have that soapy flavor. So if you also have that problem, this is a great way to try to mitigate that. And that actually brings up a great point, Amber, because I was actually just about to ask everybody if they wanted to write in the chat box whether or not they think cilantro tastes like soap, because we know this is actually um, a physiological condition, if you will, where some people just have, I guess it, I don't actually remember what causes it, but um, it might be a gene or something where when you taste cilantro, you taste soap and then other people do not taste soap and they love it. Some people taste soap and they still like it, but a lot of people who get that soapy taste say, oh, I'm not a fan of cilantro. I will say we're using it in so many dishes today, but if you don't like cilantro or you or you have that soap issue, you can very easily, you know, use parsley in something like the slaw. You know, you can definitely come up with some other options. I like Amber's suggestion of like a green onion or maybe even chives in some of these applications, like a chive and parsley combo could be kind of yummy. All right, oh, yeah. so far, no one has reported the soap taste, which is good news. Hopefully we didn't scare those people away from signing up for this class. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, I will say in Hispanic food, it's hard to avoid completely. So, you know, that's one thing. If you go to a restaurant and you have that issue, you it could be a little problematic for you. Um, but if you cook your food at home, you can, you know, make those adjustments that work for you. Right. Absolutely. I do think that that's a great leeway into our next part. So I'm going to go ahead and put in this. Uh, let me see. I'll put this bowl up here. Hopefully that works well. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and put two limes. The way I like to use citrus is to roll it out. And that's gonna help crush that pulp in there. So hopefully it's easier to squeeze. There's lots of different ways to squeeze it. Today, I'm going to use a citrus press just for sake of ease because I have a lot of finger cuts and I'm not looking to get too much line action in my fingers. You'll notice I didn't even bother mixing all of my veggies together yet. The reason I do this is because when I add my spices in, I want to be able to easily see if they're fully um, mixed in and it's more homogenous. So I don't mix anything in so I can see if I have a big chunk of apples in one area, chances are my cumin's not mixed in either. Okay, this line is definitely showing my lack of strength. Um, I'm <laughs> doing my best. Theoretically, you shouldn't need two hands, but I'm, it's fine. I am definitely one of those people that buy the jug, uh, the container of like 100% squeeze lime juice and lemon juice because I do have very um, not agile fingers. Um, Okay, that's two limes, and then I can add in my olive oil. 
When we're using a raw salad like this, we can use extra virgin olive oil, which is what I'm using, but any type of oil, olive oil will work. I personally really like the flavor of extra virgin olive oil and I only use it when I'm using a raw dish. And then, and that's mainly because of the smoking point. I don't want it to burn. So I only use it in this application. Uh, only other things. So salt, pepper, cumin, garlic. I'm sure Miss Lynetta can tell you how you too can become a proud owner of these AARP measuring spoons. I love them because they stop together. Um, and I didn't even have to wait until I was 45. So I'm just saying, I think Miss Lynetta has some favoritisms over here um, for people that will cook her food. So if you'll cook for her, I'm sure she'll give you one as well. But I bet there's easier ways, right Miss Lynetta? Um, yeah, the apron, everything you have, everyone who join us can have. I see Cynthia is asking about salt. Salt? Oh, I just haven't added it yet. Um, salt, I'm doing a fourth of a teaspoon. And then I'm just gonna do some cracked pepper. Soon. So for there, I'm gonna use tongs. Use tongs to mix mine so I can watch it get combined really well. I believe in this gentle lift motion when we're mixing things like this. So that way we don't have maybe this roll action. So that way we don't have to worry about stuff flying everywhere. The reason we're making this first is so that way we can easily store this in the fridge. We want to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. So this is going to be something where we can let it marinate with that acid and oil let's sit on hand this is actually a dish that does get better the longer it sits so day two is my favorite time to eat this all right so i'm gonna put that to the side and we you can see i already rinsed off my cutting board so i'm good to go and ready to move on to our fajita bowl so I already got my cilantro pre-cut. From there, we're gonna cut our onion and our bell pepper, um, as well as our toppings. So for our bell pepper, you already heard, I like to use it just like that jalapeno. So I cut the walls and I like to cut the bottom too. I like to use that part. If you pay for it, why not, right? And then I'm always thinking about the forkability. I might have to coin that term because I don't think that's real um, of my vegetables. So I want them, I'm gonna cut my strips, but I'm gonna then look at it and be like, all right, what do you wanna be? Sometimes it wants to be half, sometimes it wants to be thirds. I'm gonna make halves. If you like the longer look in the strips, by all means, please cut however length, long of a length you like. You'll see as I'm cutting, I'm always cutting skin side down so I have the least amount of resistance. And I'm also pushing everything to the side as I cut so I don't lose all of this real estate and have all these vegetables everywhere. The other part of that is to make sure that whenever I'm cutting, I don't cut multiple produce on the same um, cutting. So once I'm done cutting bell pepper, it has to go in a separate bowl and just sit on the side. For onion, same idea. Um, onions have a root and a stem. You hear this every time. So I'm gonna cut off the stem. Oops. And then I'm gonna cut my root in half. And then I can peel back the outer layers pretty easily. see 
every time I do something, I'm doing an assembly style way. I'm not, I'm gonna peel them both, get rid of all the peel and then move on. From here, I can cut off the root. If I was gonna dice this, I'd leave the root on. You can watch one of my previous videos to see how we do that. From there, um, I'm gonna cut my onion in half, which would be like it's equator. And then I'm gonna cut my slices so that I don't have to cut them again once we go through. And I'm just cutting her with my knife following the natural ridges of that onion until it becomes a little unstable, at which point I make that part flat. And then I keep going. The smaller we cut, also the quicker it's going to take to cook. So you'll notice, depending on how hungry I am, determines how small my cuts are going to be. Now, before I start cooking my fajita, a couple things are happening, right? First, I'm cutting and my ingredients are gonna go in it. So I wanna put those to the side, but I am not cooking until all my other things are done because I want them all to be hot at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and make my toppings up so that I don't have to worry about having to wait until have hot fajita going on behind me and cold um, that gets cold while I'm making the toppings. So in this recipe, there's optional toppings, including the avocado, the jalapeno, the lime, tomato, yogurt, cilantro, salt. You can do whatever you want with those. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to make like a avocado yogurt crema and then a, with some lime juice. And then I'm gonna make a little bit of like a, almost a pico with the rest of the ingredients. So first things first with the tomato. Now, there's a couple of ways you can cut a tomato. I know Heather believes in the coring method where you take the core out with a paring knife. I'm not gonna do that only because I like to cut it out in a slightly different way. So I cut my onion, my, and with anything we're cutting, we're gonna cut in multiple different there's a lot of different ways to do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut my top off the tomato. Do that to the side, I don't need to deal with that right now. And you can see the rest of that white core in there. I'm gonna cut slices, almost like it's a good for a burger. Okay, then from there, make a stack of my slices. Go with however many you feel comfortable with. Keep in mind, I'm keeping my rounds to the side and dealing with them later. From there, I can make some slices, which will in turn become my strips. Then I can take that whole pile, turn it, and then I can cut. I'm doing it very slowly because tomatoes are slippery. Then I can cut into a dice. So that's my whole tomato already diced, which means I have a cute little piece in there that's already the core ready to take out. From there, I can cut some slices into the edge, turn that pile, add that to my pile. Lastly, I'm gonna cut some slices, skipping pretty wide on that core piece. And then I can just cut those pieces off. Make a cute little dice out of those. That's my whole tomato cut in about just over a minute, I think. Hard to tell, didn't time it. Okay, it's a lot of tomato. So that's gonna go in my tomato bowl. Also in this bowl is going to go, if you have a little bit more onion, you could put that. I'm gonna put my jalapeno. which I'm also going to make my cute little windows. Okay. 
Now with this one, I ended up with five slides. That's fine as long as you still get your window action. Then I can make. Hey Amber, while you're doing that pepper, will you mind just going over when you know, when talking about these things that you're putting together as the toppings, I know you referred to pico. Can you give a little bit more detail on that for folks who may not be familiar or as familiar with that like shorthand? I would love that. So pico de gallo is a raw, it's considered a salsa as far as like what it is. Um, usually it's going to include very basic fresh ingredients, including some pepper, like jalapeno, some tomato. Um, usually it has some type of small amount of um, small cut white onion. And then it's really just from there, you can add a little spices, but it's really mostly salt, pepper, lime juice. So the reason this isn't a pico, a couple of reasons. I didn't cut my tomato small enough for it to be even pieces with the onion and, um, and jalapeno, but also because I'm not putting onion. So it's the way that we have um, we can have a, um, a rough cut raw salsa action without having to do just tomato or to blend it up. And the reason I love this is because it's really every vegetable is the star of the show versus a common, um, a common salsa is really just focused on tomato. Yeah, I love um, a, a salsa like this too, because it is very versatile. Like today you're using it in what you would might think of, you know, as a traditional way to use it in a dish like this as part of a topping. But, you know, you could very easily whip up a version of that and serve it with tortilla chips for dipping. It makes a great topping for just like some nice grilled or uh, like a baked or sauteed fish um, because, already you can see she's adding so much flavor to it, but it's all very simple stuff that you can just quickly and easily throw together. Mm -hmm. um, and you could also, this would be really delicious with some added garlic as well. I'm not going to mix this. I'm going to mix it at the same time as the other dish, which is going to include my avocado. Yeah. I also like adding other things in my little salsas, like maybe some corn. I know you like a corn salsa too, Amber. I love um, salsa. There's so many, like, there, this is just a jumping off point. You know, you can add whatever you like. Um, so for avocado, we cut it, push down, and you're just rolling it. Notice I don't take the avocado off the cutting board until it's cut all the way through. You can do this with a paring knife if you want. Then we just twist. I hold my avocado on the board when I take out the seed. And then, again, you can use a paring knife for this, which I will, just for safety. You can cut some slices, maybe some dices if you're trying to use. You could then from there you can scoop it out and just have dice or sliced avocado. I'm gonna turn mine almost into a, I'm gonna turn into a mash. This one's gonna be a just gonna put this. You can see it's already a dice from there. But I want this to turn into more of a um mock on a guac. The reason I'm calling it a mock because I'm really just trying to mash it and then I'm gonna make it into a crema with our um, yogurt. So I'm not making it all the way into the guac, but I'm gonna treat it in the first stages of the guacamole, which includes putting it in. Oh, I knew I was gonna have to use that fork, which is why I conveniently have it. We just mash the avocado. You can also make a really delicious crema by blending together in a blender, the avocado and the yogurt. Yeah, I, that's fun if you want it really, really smooth, but I actually kind of like this way you're doing now that gives leaves a little texture to it. And I really like this because when we add in that yogurt, it's gonna add in this nice acidity combined with the avocado. I mean, sorry, combined with the lime, it's going to have so much acidity that it's gonna take longer for the avocado to turn brown. So it's really great for leftovers. Most important thing when we're doing this is to really just be mindful of not um, 
sorry, so that we don't have um, a flavored yogurt. That will really be detrimental <laughs> to this dish. <laughs> Oh no, can you imagine if you like accidentally put some strawberry yogurt up in there? <laughs> oh, my parents buy vanilla yogurt and they absolutely, my mom was cooking along in one of these things and she's like, this just doesn't taste right. And I was like, we're trying to figure out what it was. And she used flavored yogurt, bless her heart. Yeah, um, plain yogurt is definitely more versatile because you can use it with your fruit for your breakfast, you could use it for something like this. So we definitely promote the plain yogurt. Yeah, and you can always add some honey or some vanilla to it if you need it. Right, right. Um, Amber, I would just like to share the the reason that we have this recipe written the way it is for people for you to build your own bowl, and it's kind of this like choose your own adventure style of we just give you suggestions for these toppings, but you can ultimately do what you want really is because this recipe originated as being used with our medical students. And we wanted to show them, you know, that they could take some control and not just always follow a recipe exactly word for word and play around a little bit. Um, we were doing this recipe with them in their home kitchens last year through zoom. So it was a great way uh, for us to, to do that. And we're still using it now in person as well. So that's the background behind why we do it this way. I also will say that I do usually do this com the same combination that Amber's doing, but you could also put your diced tomato in with your mashed avocado if you really wanted to, or, you know, you could, you could do, you have a lot of options there. Um, you could leave everything very separate and just use them as eat, you know, individual toppings if you wanted to. Definitely. And I'm going to add a little bit of my taco spice. Ooh. To this guac. Oh, well, not guac. Sorry, crema. Because I wanted to add a little bit of paprika and a little bit of garlic. And then I was like, or you know what? I'm putting that on everything. So easy. I love that idea, Amber. I've actually never thought to do it. You have to let me know how this batch comes out. I'm really hoping that that lime activates the flavors i think it will I i'm have... worried it's going to make it look slightly less attractive as far as color wise but it's cool perfect so i'm gonna leave my toppings on the side so that they stay cold all right and oh i didn't put my mm. Hi, Dad. Some cilantro action not much because again, I really don't want the flavor of soap and everything for me, but it's a great spot to put it for you. Okay, um, my rice is done. So this wasn't the time I was going to handle rice, but I am going to right now just because I don't want it to sit too long. So let me just strain my rice really quickly. And make, give your rice a taste before you strain it, just to make sure it's perfect for you. I like mine a little softer. Heather likes hers a little bit more al dente. Either way, if it's too starchy for you, just give it a little rinse under water and all that extra starch will come off. We also have a note in our recipe. We tend to use parboiled brown rice here in the kitchen, which just means that it's, you know, the it's taken the edge off. Typically brown rice, you're going to need 40 to 45 minutes to cook that all the way through, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like brown rice, uh, because ultimately white rice does cook faster. Um, brown rice has a little bit more fiber. So we and it is a whole grain. That's why we use it in the kitchen. Um, if you're not using parboiled brown rice, you do need to keep that in mind um, that you will have to cook yours longer than what Amber has done today. This is my rice, it's super fluffy. So to this, just to skip ahead, we're going to add that cilantro. I'm adding in my stems to this. It's still hot, so it's gonna help cook some of that off. Put a little bit more of the leaf action. Mix that in. And we're going through about 500 lines today. <laughs> All right, that's uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. How many did you actually use? 
three, four, four. I think we're up to this four. Is, I think this is number four. Okay. I think so. Um, maybe this is number three and a half because I had a bonus. Okay. I think, I think, okay, this one's number four. You're right. I will just say though, for the record, that you know, acid is one of our favorite ways to add flavor to food without having to rely really heavily on salt. And we all know for everybody, it is important that we be watching our sodium intake because typically we all are getting a little too much, more than we should. Um, so acid, and in, you know, in this case, lime juice is one of our great ways that we can add a lot of flavor. Yes, Cynthia, agree. Lime, lemon, great way to, to add flavor. Oh, All Patricia right. actually prefers brown rice. I've, that's great, Patricia. Um, I, I, I find that I like both. And sometimes I want brown rice and then other times I want white rice. And I just, you know. Yeah. Have whichever one I'm feeling at the moment. All right, Amber, I think I'm going to, it's a time for me to switch over to your uh, stove cam so we can get yeah. it. Open. Yeah, I'm also going to pull out my mango and pineapple that I'm going to use in my drink so that way it gets a little softer at room temp. Oh, right. We got our frozen mango and pineapple. It is good to give those a little head start before just sticking them straight into the blender. So, yep, I'm preheating my pan. Do we need, did you do your chicken? Did I miss that? I'm so sorry. No, I do it while I'm preheating my pan. I wanted okay, to make gotcha. sure that everything was done because if you're using the same cutting board, you don't want to cross your chicken. So, but that means if you're going to use the same cutting board, cut your, cut your citrus now for your drink. I'm not going to, I'm going to use a separate cutting board over so I can easily just pull it away. So chicken. We're always cutting our protein last so it doesn't cross contaminate. So I have it right here. I also like to use a plastic board for my, you know, raw protein, just so that I feel good about putting it right in the um, dishwasher. Oh yeah. That's always okay. convenient. So chicken, um, the recipe says that we're gonna use half a pound of chicken. We're gonna cut it into strips. So I'm gonna cut my strips in this direction. And then from there, these are a bit thick for me. So I'm just gonna cut in half the long way. There we go. And then I'm just gonna store my raw chicken back in the container it came in until I'm ready. And then I'm instantly getting ready all of my raw chicken and I'm going to wash my hands. Never be too careful with raw protein, which is why I wanted to preheat my pan first so I'm ready to go when the chicken breaks. That was so smart, Amber. You're a genius. I love it. Okay. My pan. Flames been going. Put my hand over it. It's hot. I'm going to measure in my two teaspoons of oil. All right. I've got you spotlighted now on your uh, stove, just so you know. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to move my oil around. The more it moves, the hotter, I mean, it'll move more when it's hot. So we just want to get as hot as we can uh, before we add any of our produce in. We're going to add our, so to have everything ready, you need to have your onion and bell pepper. I'm going to move those next to the stove. And then your chicken and your black beans and your taco seasoning. That's everything that's happening. Mm. And you're some salt. Okay. My oil, I think, is going to be hot enough. I'm moving it around, making sure it's covering all the spots of my pan. Then I'm going to put in one piece of my first product, which is onion. If it sizzles, which it is, it's ready. I love when you hear that sizzle sound when everything goes in the pan. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
and you start to smell it right away. I, I wish I had smell a vision right now. Oh yeah, definitely. So I gave mine a shake and then I'm just gonna let it sit. Anytime we're mixing or incorporating cold air, it'll take longer. I'm looking for these to go, onion will go from white to translucent to a light yellow, to a light brown, to a medium brown, to a dark brown, and then to a black. We're trying to avoid those latter colors. So we really just want it to get to a nice brown. And then that's when it's considered caramelized. And we can add in our bell pepper is once it starts to get light brown. And this part's gonna go together super quick. Amber, one of the things I like about this recipe too is that you do have some control over how cooked or like how done you like your vegetables. You know, I feel like in traditional fajitas, if you think about what you get in a restaurant, a lot of times they're very um, al dente. You know, they're they're they've still got some bite to them, but other times they can be quite soft. So you can play around with that. And if you like your veggies really nice and soft, you can cook them longer. If you like to get some crunch action still in, in the bite, then you can definitely go a little shorter. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of flexibility. I'm gonna leave those onions there for a second and measure out my mango and pineapple and my citrus for my mocktail. So that way I'm not ever standing still. I don't wanna waste any time. So I'm gonna put those two cups of mango, two cups of pineapple into two-ish. I'm a firm believer in the ish technique because I don't think cooking, that's why I'm not a baker. I want, I cannot handle anything exact. So just gonna listen to my chefiness and it says that was a good amount. Now, if you want for this, um, for this mocktail, if you want it to be sweeter, just use only mango. If you want it to be, um, it will be very, very tart if you only use pineapple, but that's an option. Other things you could do is you could add in some um, strawberry, frozen strawberries, delicious, any type of frozen berry, it will change the color. It'll be slightly less tropical, but then you just end up with a berry frozen mar margarita mocktail instead. Um, so that's two cups each. Now we're gonna do two oranges. Anytime you're working with citrus, if you want it to be more, um, if you want it to be more citrusy, you can add in the zest of the lemon or the lime or the orange. I'm not really interested in a little bit more, so I'm just going to leave it as is. Just got a little bit out of that half that I had on hand. So, one more lime. We're almost there in the lime front. <laughs> Last limes. Oh, I keep one to the side. I made some wedges for some, um, making a rim on our oh, rim. Yeah, we got to have our got uh, really got rim. Now, Amber, I know that you and I, when we were working on this recipe um, a while ago, we talked about fresh orange juice, you know, versus the kind that comes out of a carton or a jug or a bottle at the store. I think, you know, you could go either way with this for sure. I like the fresh, if you have the fresh, you know, if you've got some oranges, I think it's nice, but you could go with the store-bought too. The store-bought does have added sugar though. So I would just be mindful of not adding in all the honey. Yeah. And also just, I mean, this can be a bit customized to your taste. We know this recipe, if you're making this with us or if you make this after the fact, it's pretty tart, but that was sort of what we were going for since it is a margarita and traditionally margaritas are pretty, you know, sour. They've got that sour element to them. 
We don't have any alcohol in this one. Of course, if that's something that's part of your life, maybe not at this time of day, <laughs> or maybe uh, if you're having this later, you would add some tequila, but you, you know, I think this will be a really nice treat without it. Um, we really enjoyed it. It definitely gives you that little bit of a pucker. You get the sweet tart balance going on. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second because I can hear that my onions are ready. Oh, I can see they're getting a little color on them. Oh, yeah. They got a little over ready. That's okay. I like them like that. Me too. All right. Back. Um, lemon lime. Oh, sorry, lime, orange, mango, pineapple, honey. So now I can just add in my honey to my blender. I already pre measured mine. Mm. All right. I'm not going to blend my hand until I pause, but in the meantime, I'm going to let that sit, getting a little bit warmer. I cut some limes into wedges. Okay, more lime. And I'm going with sugar because I needed something to make this a little less tart for me. So, what we do to make our rim ready, just take one. Traditionally, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it where there's a, a bowl of lime juice. This is way easier. Just rub some lime on the rim all the way around and then you do this rocking motion you just keep turning it until now you don't want to do a push down twist or crush because then it won't stick and then i have a nice sugar rim ah it's so beautiful i also love that glass by the way amber it's so pretty I wasn't a hundred percent sure it works. So I tried it in three different <laughs> uh. <laughs> for me and all, no one else that's here <laughs> just in case. Okay. I love so those glasses glass. though. They're so pretty. And I feel like that's such a nice little like treat for yourself to serve yourself a drink in a special little glass. I think things taste better in pretty glasses and when they're smaller like this, it helps you feel better about your serving size too. So uh, I'm going to go with the one I did just now because I feel really good about it. <laughs> it that it came out perfectly. Hey, I'm mixing my veggies. Oh, let me get back to your stove. Here. All right. Watch that for a second while I blend my blender. I'm going to mute my stove so that way it's not too loud. All right. We'll just take a peek. We'll just be watching these peppers and onions. Um, we also have a version of this recipe where we add mushrooms into this mixture. So that's another thing to keep in mind. You could certainly add additional veggies to your fajita mixture. We've got so much going on with all the toppings. I don't think we need it for like health sake. We've got so many colors and textures and variety going on. Um, and that's really one of the easiest ways you can make dishes good for you is just thinking about that. Where can you add additional colors, textures, flavors by adding lots of different fruits, vegetables, legumes and beans. We got whole grains. We've got some, you know, lean protein, some low fat dairy. We got it all going on. Oh, and I did want to just share the results of the um, uh, other question that Lynetta asked at your registration. I know she asked if people preferred their chips with salsa or avocado or like guacamole. And I will say it looked like the answers were pretty split 50-50 right down the middle, um, which I thought was great. I think um, it's nice today we're using a little bit of both, but you could certainly just use whichever is your favorite. One of the things that I love the most about avocado, and I'm not sure if I've shared it with uh, this audience yet, is that avocado, while it's definitely known for being 
really heart healthy in terms of the kinds of fats that it contains. It has the monounsaturated fats, which are the best uh, for our heart health, which is wonderful. We love that. Um, they also are a really great source of fiber. And so when we're thinking about dishes and wanting to increase the fiber content to help keep us full in between meals, as well as provide additional heart health benefits, you know, it helps balance your blood sugar. It will help with your digestive system. So many things it does for us. So I love avocado for that reason. Eileen is signing off. Thank you, Eileen, for joining us. Sorry, we're going a little bit close to the end time here. We're probably going to go a few minutes over. So if anybody does have to hop off for a meeting or some other type of appointment, thank you for joining us. This video is being recorded and we will share that with you if you want to catch the tail end. Um, Amber, how's it going there? Ready. Okay. So all right. you push them all to the side once they're ready. Okay. And then we add our chicken to the center. And just make sure it has as much contact as possible. Now you'll notice when we're cooking, we want to have as much surface contact as possible. And when, if it sticks, it means it's not ready. So don't move it unless it wants to be moved. So we're just going to let that chicken sit. The reason we're doing this is because the outside is going to have the least amount of heat so the veggies can keep cooking while focusing the center heat on that chicken. And then my mocktail is definitely ready. I'm super excited. Now I had to add a little water to get it to finish blending. But I feel like that's the way with all frozen beverages you have to really see how it works for you some sometimes the frozen stuff has more or less water content oh it looks good boom ready to go that's gonna be delicious now on the side i can get my bowl ready of my other elements while my chicken's still going i can make Put a scoop of my rice. Now, some options I also set up is I made I did some chips. Oh, those look really brown in the picture. These are like a light brown here. Now I'm worried about all these colors not coming across right. I got some romaine. So if you want it to be more like a salad option, I'll put some lettuce down there because I like a good crunch. Now I'm building mine where I'm adding some volume. So I'm putting it at the bottom. You'll notice I put rice next to it. So that way I see a bunch of colors mounted up. Let's see. Let's check in. Hey, Amber, I want to um, have you address a comment that we have in the chat from Cynthia. So Cynthia mentioned that she would probably add some oil at this point because she said it looks like your pan is dry and i agree with her that it did look like your pan was dry what what do you have what's your comment for that um let me come over so we can really see your chicken pan so i absolutely can so this recipe is made for a non-stick pan for this exact reason um i'm not really worried about my pan burning because i'm going to add some water um when I add my spices. So all that flavor at the bottom is going to mix in. The great thing about that is that it's going to remove all that flavor from the bottom. Now here, it doesn't look burnt. It looks more like fond than burnt. Yeah. However, the pork is looking burnt. Absolutely. You can add a little bit. The most important thing is you can't add cold oil directly over any of your product because it'll absorb most of it instead of it being incorporated in. So you'd have to add the oil directly to the pan and then add in your chicken for so just keep that in mind yeah please the other thing that i like to mention is that if you feel that way one thing you can do before you take that approach is to actually just turn your heat down a little bit i think that i find especially in classes here oftentimes people will feel that way and i'll be like well the heat's up pretty high if we turn the pan down a bit we might you know counterbalance some of what's going on there but That's I think exactly those are, what I did. Yeah, those are all good approaches to take, I think. And I, I, I agree with you. You have a method to your madness a little because you are going to add that liquid and we're going to get all those nice little brown bits up from the bottom. All right. Oh, I got to keep 
bringing back your other view, Amber, because you're doing so many things at once. Oh, yeah, Cynthia, you can absolutely use stock. That's a great option. Okay. Yes. I'm doing the things that are the most bulky at the bottom. So I'm going to do my cabbage stack. So that way I can see it. I'm going to leave a nice little spot over here for my fajita blend. So if you want to, at this point, not put the other things on because you want it to be a topping, that's cool. So I'm going to put mine. I like to be functional, but also practical because I don't want to have like all these, I want to have all these separate piles so I can see it, but I don't want to have so much separate pile that it's hard to mix in when I go to eat. So that's there. Which leaves a perfect spot for the last thing that's going to happen in this pan. Heather, it'll be last time to go back over here, I promise. So my chicken, if I want to, I can take my thermometer, I can temp it, and then um, make sure it's up to temp. Now, when we do that, you have to make sure you have a decent amount of um, chicken on the probe. Otherwise, it won't get to the right temperature. Oh. All right, my chicken's over 165, so I'm good. I'm going to pour in half of my black beans because you're, I'm using half a can. I'm pouring that right over the top. I'm putting in all of my taco spice that it says in the recipe, again, over the top. And then I'm going to add in water. The reason for this is because I don't want to bite into dry. I don't want to bite into dry spice. So the more I put, the more it's going to lick off the bottom of the pan, it's going to incorporate all of that spice in, and then I can just gently mix it in without scraping the bottom of my pan. Now I added a lot of water right there, I'm sure you saw, because I know that as this finishes, you can get all that flavor off the bottom. If you look, it's, I don't know if you can see, but all that bottom um, bits are coming right off. I want that. I want all that flavor in there, that bond included, because I want to have all of those, what I call flavor crystals, incorporated into my dish. And when I have a hot pan, the best thing you can do is just add a liquid and add, it will help cool it down. I can let all that cook off and get some nice bubbles. That'll evaporate in about a minute. We can wait for that or I'm just going to do my, add some of it directly onto my plate. I'm really just trying to get that flavor mixed in. So what I'm going to do is just use a scooping mechanism onto my vegetables and beans, and then put the chicken on top. The reason I'm doing this is because that liquid can act more like a sauce. And then I don't have to have so much of a dryness when it comes to my rice. So I'm going to grab a spoon. Put a little bit of that liquid right into that pile. And then I'm going to just turn this off and let it sit there to cool. This is perfect for me as far as what I'm looking for. It has a little bit of liquid action. which is not traditional, but I do want to make sure that I'm using that as a way to incorporate flavor. And then we turn back, Heather. The last thing I have to do is I have my chicken fajita bowl. I'm making sure I can see every element. And then I'm just gonna do a sprinkle, being super mindful, the pieces of cilantro right over the top. And then if I so choose to, which I do always choose to, I have a nice little side of lime ready to go. Yum. Applause, right. applause, Cynthia says. Um, I've just been talking in the chat about how I am going to have to convince you to bring me some of your leftovers because <laughs> it looks so good. <laughs> Even though I've eaten this dish many times. Um, and we actually also just had a version of this like two days ago, but it's so good. I love it. Yeah, it never gets old. Never gets old. All right. Um, hopefully, if you have cooked along, you are enjoying uh, a nice lunch. You'll have a nice lunch ready for you. If not, hopefully you will cook these recipes later and um, let Miss Lynetta know what you think. Um, Lynetta, how did you do? Did you end up cooking along? Let me uh, change over yes. to our gallery view so we can see everybody. Yes, yes, I did. And I want to show you my dish. I'm taking it off now. 
Okay. Sounds good. I know it's a lot. We always cram a lot into these classes. Yeah. All right. I'll I recommend every, let's every I recommend everyone switch to your gallery view in the top corner, that little waffle action so that we can see how okay. how it looks. Okay, I'll show you first. This is um so my crema do I do wait a minute. <laughs> so I, I got to put the camera on. So my crema do I add it to my bowl? I, I missed that part. Yep. Yeah, you can add it to your bowl. You can drip, you know, depending on how thin it is, you can do a drizzle, you can do a blob, you know, I'm whatever. Adding it to, I'm adding it to the side. I got okay. it. Okay, hopefully you can see this. This is my, let's see. I'm going to spotlight you can actually. You can you all see this pretty good? No? Is it oh, blur? Yeah, it's get, Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> That is my fajita bowl. Um, this is my cabbage slaw that I added the Brussels. Can you see this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very yeah, colorful. With the, with the raisins. And this is my mocktail. Oh, I love you have the margarita glass and all. Yeah, yeah I do the full thing. So I'm ready for lunch. Yum! I know. Oh. Cynthia says a big one. You got a big one there. <laughs> I do. I do. And believe it or not, I saved enough for later. I can add a little spirit. You know what I mean? Yes. Later. When I'm I love off. that. So I really enjoyed today. I can't wait to try all of this stuff that I prepared. I'm, I'm always shocked about how easy it is to prepare all these dishes within an hour. If I was by myself, I don't think I could have you know, completed them within that amount of time. You all always do such a great job. Now I have another dish to add to my repertoire to surprise and delight my guests and my family. I'm looking forward to next month. And for those who are joining us, you don't want to miss next month because we will be um, talking about soups. Is, is that what's on schedule next month? I think we're doing, yeah, some like fall soup, stews, some comforting, nice, warm, comforting yeah, food. Yeah, so you have a lot to look forward to. I see we had a lot of activity in chat today, which is really, really good. Before we sign off, does it, anyone have any question? Feel free about today, about next month. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heather and Amber. Great job. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see everybody back here. Um, it, it's actually only a few weeks away. I think it we're is. three weeks away from our next class. So we have some work to do, but we'll get the link, you know, the sign up link out to everybody as soon as we can and get those recipes ready. Um, hopefully we'll see you back here for that one and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Hopefully you'll think about incorporating some Hispanic foods into your meals this month. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.